Hello, everyone. Yep. So, uh, uh, as you know, that uh, the speaker couldn't come, so we will be taking up question and answers like Q and A on OSINT, and uh, uh, no more about it. And it's going to be an interactive Q and A, so that I'm going to be asking questions to them, and then we will be popping some questions for you as well, so that it will be interactive. It shouldn't be like a speaker is speaking and then you're listening. That's it. It'll be if you have a question. In the middle, just raise your hand. We'll make sure that it gets answered. So the first question. So I would actually like to give it to Sudhanshu. Shubham. Ah, Hi guys. So basically, the idea is uh, to have a casual discussion. A lot of times we do talks and then we listen what the speaker has to say. But a lot of times, you know, the audience would like to ask some questions, which is not related to the talk they are actually attending. So you know, uh, this is the opportunity. I mean, not just for you, for us as well. I know. Uh, there are a lot of things which I would like to ask, and maybe some of you have questions. Some of you have answers to that. I would love love to answer that and to ask questions. All right. So uh, I would like to ask one thing: like, what kind of OSINT do you guys do? Is it more into security, or offensive security, or defensive security, or you guys do investigation, or is it kind of mix for you guys? I mean, I'm just trying to ask this because we want to get more talks which are, you know, which the audience is more interested in. So for the next time when we select the talks, we'll keep that in mind that, you know, what kind of audience do we get? Me, I've been doing pen testing for a long time, right? So I'm always a little biased towards that side, but I did, uh, in my last job, I used to do OSINT for investigation and due diligence, so I know a little bit about that side as well. So Danshu has done a lot of pen testing. He has always been an attacker, so, you know, if you want to not just do OSINT, but also get into security, you know, bypass antiviruses and all those, you know, malicious things. He's the guy. Jennifer has been head of research in multiple organizations. And uh, she generally do OSINT in investigations on the people side. And she's really, really good on that. So I want to ask Jennifer that how do you do human hacking? Okay, yeah, so I managed to think that I wasn't going to speak beside introducing speakers this year. Um, and look, lo and behold, I'm speaking again. Um, so yeah, so I kind of was here last year. I spoke at the Diana Initiative last year, and then I spoke on the stage. I had massive imposter syndrome, um, and it's the reason why I didn't apply to speak again this year. Um, I can't code in the slightest. I can't hack. Um, what I do, everything is behavioral science. I hack people. I follow the way that they behave. I follow the way that they act. I don't need to be able to break down things to be able to tell what their passwords are. Because guess what? If they like their kids, if they like their dog, that's most likely their password. If they're kind of simple about things, then they're going to have leaked things on everywhere else. So I basically just follow people's behaviors. Um, people are inherently stupid and people like to follow patterns. Um, so if people have got like patterns of life behavior, people like to but we're all tired of a morning, so people use the same routine. People get the same trains of a morning. So people complain about trains. The number as a London commuter, we all sit there and we complain with, as, as a London commuter, Southwest trains, why is my train delayed? Well, thank you for telling me exactly what train you get on every single morning. And then I sit there and I'm like, I'm then sitting next to you on the train and I'm having a conversation with you about the local sports team because guess what? You're following them on Twitter. Before you know it. I've just happily socially engineered myself into your life. You don't even realize it, but I know everything about you because you've put it all on your dating profile. I know your dating profile sitting there because you've used the same picture as your LinkedIn picture. Why? Because you like the headshot that your company did for you, which is also on your company profile. Like people are so, so simple. So that's kind of how I look at things. So when I kind of worked alongside these guys in different ways and shapes and forms, I've kind of looked at things in a really, really different way in that I kind of come at it from a, well, that's great what these guys can do and they can massively, massively help me in different ways. But actually from my perspective, people are like, 
you hear it so many times, people are the weakest link, but people are inherently stupid. And whether it is, no matter how good at security anybody else is, there's somebody in your family who is stupid. And it might be your 12-year-old kid. It might be your 60-year-old gran who's just decided she wants to get an Instagram account to see what is going on. But people don't understand. I've got new bosses because I've just joined a new company and they've all decided we need to learn Twitter. No, you don't. Please just keep off it. But they've all gone on there and they've all done randomly weird things like follow their kids. Great. Thanks. You've also all joined your housing association, so now I know exactly where you all live. Um, no, that's kind of what I end up doing. So it's in a really roundabout way um, is what I end up doing in a really long thing. This is why I don't talk, because uh, I can't stop. Um, so that's what ends up happening. All right, so I will uh, throw a question to Sudanshu. Sure. Uh, Sudanshu, so when you, you do any kind of security exercise, mm -hmm. be a pen tester or a team, what is your approach, you know, on how you start OSINT, you know, figuring out a company and then how do you go about it? And how, how effective is this process? I mean, how is it different from doing just pen test and not doing a lot of recon and versus you do a lot of recon? So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Thanks, Shubham. Yeah, so I've been doing pen testing for quite some time now and I've identified that recon is one of the most important process not the exploitation, not the privilege escalation, or the persistent one. If you know your recon, if you identify the organization or your target, you can do a greater amount of damage than running just exploits on them, right? So we do it all the way. So the first thing that uh, I would like to mention is if you have a name or a target or a domain, whatever you're going to start with, just identify anything that is associated to it, right? Now, it depends on the type of the asset that you're targeting, right? If it's a domain, that you can enumerate subdomains. If it's an IP address, you can see what are the IP addresses associated to it, near to it, or neighbors to it, right? So we can do different things around different technologies, different assets. If it's a website, the first thing that we try to do is to identify the open ports, to identify the technology stack, instead of just running a SQL injection or trying to run a burp scan over it, right? So identifying the, anything that is associated to your target type, that is the primary thing that I try to do. Once I have that information, then I go into deeper, like let's say if it's a web application, then I'll try to crawl that application, see what are the keywords that they are using, if there's any directory that I can enumerate. Once I have that information, then I'll go into the exploitation or identification of the vulnerabilities. So that is how we approach about vulnerabilities in general. Anything specific, feel free to answer. So do you have any interesting case where you find someone has done a really, really big stupidity Maybe you're leaking some information or leaving some misconfiguration in the system. Any of the you know stories you have around this? Yeah. These stories like sound really, really stupid or simple sometimes. Like I was doing a pen test for an, an organization, and they had uh, just they just gave us a domain and said that okay, enumerate the information, identify the target attack surface, and then in the next phase, you're going to do the exploitation and testing of the stuff. But in the first phase itself, we identified some credentials being leaked on GitHub and some on Pastebin. And we, even before the test was going to start, we had the admin level access just because the credentials are lying out there. So it might sound really stupid that it was a really simple assessment. We didn't do any hardcore exploitation on RC over them. But just because that information is out there, anyone could do it, right? So this makes them a really lucrative target because it's really, really easy for anyone to do it. You don't need to do, know how a tool runs, how to use command line, or how a specific technology works. But just because that information is lying out there, you can directly use and exploit it to gain that admin access. And once we had that access, it was really easy to get into the network and to pivot into the domain admin, and it was game over. Right? Because parameter is one which people really care about. Once you are inside that parameter, inside the internal network, it's usually a DA or the credentials or the credit card details. So that's usually how it goes. Well, I'm surprised how relaxed, in how relaxedly you say you're just a DA, you know? It's not a joke. Yeah, so if from what, from what uh, Jenny said and what Sudhanshu said, I remember one of the story which is into security. And as Jenny said, people are inher inherently stupid. So uh, one of the pen tests I was doing, and then uh, I was doing a little bit of OSINT on the, on the target. I was already inside the machine tr trying to do some brute forces on the Windows boxes. And then uh, searching the name of the company, I, I find a GitHub repository. 
uh, the person actually revealed the password. The password was summer seven, summer seventeen, and then I was like, "All right, let me try that." That didn't work, so I went back and I was thinking, "Hey, uh, so the person actually is using this password and should work somewhere." So I realized I went back again to the GitHub repository, checked the date of the repository. It says 2017. So the next thing I was trying was summer 18 because I was doing the test in 2018 and bang on this worked. I was like, "What? This shouldn't work, man." I mean, it was it was as stupid, and and that day I realized that you know a lot of times people, when you say that you should not use same password across multiple websites, what people do is they will come up with the patterns, right? So the patterns I have seen is password, you know, name appended by you know the first three letters of the domain name, or maybe the first three letters of the form fields, some weird patterns. And the problem with that is once you once someone figure out that pattern, it is as easy you know as trying the same password everywhere. So yeah, so I, I would like to ask these you guys, how many of you use the same password and at multiple websites? Or if someone vol would like to volunteer to share the password? Share the password yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're DEF CON. give a demo of it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. So uh, now we've talked about the use cases, we have talked about human hacking, attacking. Correct. But how do we do defense, against, like defense for OSINT? What should we do right. to make sure that our data is safe. All right, so there's definitely overlap when you do um, OSIN for defensive security. Few things which you have to do is when you do attack, you just do it once. But when you do defense, you have to do it in a recursive manner. So you know, uh, you obviously you have to attack somewhere. So you'll you know try to scrape, which will scrape GitHub and look out for your password, sensitive information about your organization. But you won't just check it once. You will check it maybe daily or weekly and figure out you know. As soon as someone goes out about your organization on, on, on any of these websites, you should get an alert, notification, a Slack, whatever. Similarly, you should have a really good track of your assets because when you are in cloud, you don't even know if your box only has a private IP address or you know someone just appended a public IP address as well, or maybe someone changed the security group. So you know, you have to keep an eye on how many assets you have, keep constantly checking them. Similarly, if you have some vulnerabilities uh, in terms of uh, you know any of the uh, any of the users revealing information, or if you would like to keep a check if someone talks about your company in security manner, for example, if someone talks about the companies, you know, I just hacked your company, and someone tweets about it. So before uh, the whole world gets to know, you should definitely know about it. So you should have a check on these keywords. Maybe you can use the streaming APIs of Twitter, and keep an eye that as soon as someone talks about your company. You should get an alert, and you are the first one who should be taking action on top of it. Maybe it's a false positive, maybe it's a negative. It doesn't matter because it's in terms of reputation. You should be on top of it, right? Uh, similarly, you can use a lot of threat intelligence feeds. For example, if you have SIEM systems, and you get an IP address hitting you and hitting your website again and again, you can maybe check the rank of the website and assign a score to the IP address. Now, if the IP address is sending multiple requests based on your score. You can actually block the IP address a little, a little earlier than you will block other IP addresses. So you know you can, and there are so many things about it. You can use Google Alerts. You can use detection, a page detection kind of things to make sure you know what's what kind of parameter you are leaking out. All right. So, I mean, I, it cannot be summarized in just one answer. Or of course, there is no specific way to talk about it. But overall, uh, these things should be checked in a recursive manner, especially if you are doing OSINT on your own organization. You should keep an eye. Uh, on these things in a recursive manner. Thank you. Uh, so, can we have questions from the audience? Sure. So, this is my question for Jenny, right? Yeah. Um, have you ever ran into a individual or personality who stumped you? Can you speak to that? Maybe there's something um, uh, interesting about their personality that makes it difficult for them to be. Hacked. Can you use this? Um, so yeah, um, there's a couple of cases, um, uh, and and there's one that I'll kind of mention. Um, people who have split personality disorder are really difficult to follow because which personality do you follow? So. 
Um, somebody that I was actually trying to map out had multiple personality disorder. Now, I was able to map out 12 of their personalities, and 12 of them all interacted. And you could, and the problem was, two, well, they didn't all interact. Three of them interacted together, and the rest of them were all separate. Now, you could see there was a clear delineation of timings that occasionally the person ended up dealing with. Some of them ended up using similar, similar kind of variations of phone numbers. Some of them used the same phone number, others. And it, but it was really one of those that some of them, as soon as, the, as soon as the personality of the individual changed, they used a different mobile, they used a different device. They went from, they went from a Windows device to a Mac device, and it was one of those of a... I, this this is impossible, and and it is it's one of those of a, okay. I, I'm, what is the purpose of what I'm trying to do here, and what is it? And that's what it always ends up coming down to. And it, it's a case of what, how am I trying to map it out? When it comes to large criminal organizations, so I've, I work with a number of different charities. I work with a number of human trafficking charities, um, and trying to track those organizations tends to be really, really difficult because they are so much better and advanced than we are at monitoring them. So they know, uh, they know our methodologies better than we know our own methodologies in how to track them. And that's why we struggle, because they know how, how to hide better than we know how to find them. So they're the ones that I normally find the difficulties for. So where I work with Stop the Traffic and I'm I'm kind of the Nigeria lead with that. And even though I can sit there and tell you a lot of information to do with here are the best, here are the networks that end up working across there and here are the key individuals, pinpointing those individuals ends up being incredibly difficult. I will be able to tell you the people on the ground. I will be able to show you the picture and can I, I'll have their mobile number and can I give you anything more than that? I'll be able to tell the police on the ground here the, the details and then I can't piece the final elements together. Um, and they tend to be the, the weirdest cases. Um, sometimes I just can't find people. Um, the less information I find about people, the weirder it tends to be. Um, kind of bringing into what you were saying about how can you kind of reduce your the risk. Um, I work with a lot of high net worth people because they're like, oh, help me reduce my footprint. Or people will turn around and go, I don't have social media, I'm safe. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> hello, challenge accepted. Um, because I don't care if you've not got an active footprint, I'll find you passively because someone's taken a picture of you. If you've walked along this corridor today, I don't care if you haven't got Twitter, somebody's put you on their Twitter today. Um, and you've got... If you live anywhere, you're on an electoral roll somewhere, your birth records are somewhere, somebody's leaked some information about you. So the passive records are out there about you. If I can't pa find passive records to do with you, and I can't find active records to do with you, do you exist? Have you changed your name? If you've changed your name, how have you done that? Because records to do with name changes are also kept. And that's when I'm really then starting to question. And if I can't find anything to do with you, that's really when I'll start getting a little antsy. And that's probably when I'll start rooting towards these people with a, help me find what I need. Um, and there you go. Uh, generally speaking, how would each of you hide from yourselves? <laughs> Pass it over to you. Yeah. <laughs> right. okay. Any other questions, guys? Sorry about having just one mic here. So, for somebody that's just getting started with investigative recon, what are some of the most valuable tools or services available that you found in your experience? Um, there is no magic tool. Um, my boss wishes there wasn't a magic tool. Um, the, I, there are certain things that depend on what you want to do. Um, Pipple is a great thing. I'm not going to advertise anything, but Pipple is a great tool. 
Um, if you have any form of detail that like goes with a phone number or an email address, it's a great starting point. Um, and I honestly, from there on in, would use a lot of stuff that you'll end up finding on GitHub. Um, beyond that, honestly, the rest of it is just kind of be searching around. I wouldn't go paying for a lot of the tools that are out there. Um, that's simply my choice. Um, I would recommend the data exploit tool that the boys standing next to me develop because it's amazing. Um, but yeah, definitely check out the data exploit tool that these boys use and have developed. Um, and they don't use it, they develop it. What am I talking about? Um, but yeah, take, what I would honestly recommend is all of these tools have trials. Use them, see if it's useful for you. Um, don't ever sign up to anything unless you do use the trial because that's the worst thing you can possibly do. Um, most places, if they don't offer you a trial, it's because they're trying to trap you immediately into something and you're just going to end up getting trapped. Um, never ever get trapped into that, oh, we've got all this amazing data. Um, if you love LinkedIn information, Rocket Reach is your one forward that'll give you your email addresses from LinkedIn. I would like to add to that something. So there's no such tool that can help you in anything that you require, right? So because every time your requirement would be different, sometimes you're trying to identify the domains of a company, next time you're behind a person, right? So the best tool that I would recommend is your methodology, right? If you understand what you're behind and you want to, how you want to achieve, then you can achieve, right? So like Jenny mentioned, we created a tool of our own because we're not finding anything out there which helped our case. It might not help you, you can give it a try, definitely. But it's the methodology and understanding of what you are behind and how you can identify that, that is going to help you. And if you know that, you can just hire anyone to code it or you can code it yourself. So uh, we can take one more question before we wrap up. So... Um when you're conducting some uh, investigation for a red teaming exercise to participate in the reconnaissance phase, and of course there are many aspects in, uh, in this kind of investigation. So there's the organization itself, its financial position, many of the important uh, employees, uh, affiliates, you name it. So you have a shit ton of information and you really need to correlate them uh, in one way or another, and maybe your brain is sometimes too little to do that, as smart as you are. Um, do you have any uh, tips and tricks on data management in, in terms of, uh, of this kind of um, correlation? Yeah, so as far as I understand your question, you were asking about uh, when um, we do any kind of investigation or OSINT to Red Team, we find a lot of data. Could be in terms of uh, inter in, uh, important people or assets or financial acquisitions or whatever. How do we keep a track of that data? Is that what you're asking? Not just track of it. So you want to connect the dots, right? Yeah. You want to connect some transaction with one of the connections or the hot testing tools. Yeah, so, uh, so there, there are definitely a bunch of phases in this. So one, one is that you document everything, of course, that goes without saying, where uh, you might use whatever editors you have, or you know CSV files. Plus, you, sh you should always record these kind of sessions. Uh, maybe you can use browser add-ons or some screen recorder softwares so that you know what you are searching for. And if you find something, you always have an evidence. Once you have the information, the most important part is to connect the dots, as you asked. And none of the tool, as far as I know, will automatically do it for you. So uh, most most of the time, I have seen. Uh, Analysts using some graph softwares where you visualize these things. Uh, you can obviously do it manually, you know, but you can use utilities like Lumify or you know, uh, case file. You, you can use case file. You can use Multigo, where you you know just pump data and then connect the dots, those kind of things. And uh, especially in, in the kind of exercises I do, uh, we don't really have to join a lot of dots. It's not more than one or two layers of you know uh, the information we have. But especially when you are doing investigations, or especially around people, that's where you find some information on Facebook, and then you know you reverse image that, do this, do that. So that's that's where a lot of uh, <clears throat> layers are there. So and I think in in, in red teaming and all, you don't need a lot of uh, joining the dots kind of thing. Of course, there are a few layers, 
and it depends on the kind of size of the organization. But uh, honestly, I've not encountered such kind of tests so far. OK. That's what we'll wrap up there, and we'll move on to the next session. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>